So we're going to be talking about uh, neuroscience and how it relates to otherness and actually how that intersects both with issues around the economy, how we think about the economy, how we think about race. Otherness, that's actually what you've been seeing. And one reason uh, at the Haas Institute, we actually use the frame of belonging and otherness. It's actually very powerful in the um, social science, uh, social psychology. Uh, when, when you have a sense of not belonging, being socially isolated, it has more negative effects than smoking, high blood pressure, or obesity. So it's not just a fuzzy concept. We can measure it. It actually changes the structure of your brain and your body when you are deeply othered. Uh, and we're going to see that part of what we talk about when we talk about race is the process of othering. But othering also is also used by the dominant group to actually construct belonging. So who belong matters. Uh, I've written a piece where I say the most important thing that a society gives or withholds is membership and belonging. And that's true across the world. So I, I just came back from France and England. So they do race differently, but they do othering very similarly. Uh, so it's always important to sort of look at how people understand othering and who, on whose back othering occurs. And then when you look at civil rights and issues of economy, it's often a process of how do we fully belong. So in many ways, you could say othering is the problem of the 21st century. And that's exacerbated by the fact that you have almost 300 million people moving from the south to the north. Uh, so Europe is experiencing it. Uh, in Africa, people are experiencing it. You have more immigrants in Africa than you have in Europe. Uh, and so as people move, it creates a sense of who are these people? Do they belong? Do they not belong? Uh, and that's actually a major problem that's happening in virtually every part of the world. Um, and so if we're going to transform this, we have to engage with the issue of belonging. And uh, even though we have some time, it's actually a very complicated concept because we exist in relationship to each other. So because we're in relationship to each other, it's not always an equal relationship, we affect each other. Uh, and sometimes that effect is uncomfortable and more than uncomfortable. So we have a conference in May, I think it's May 1st, on othering and belonging. You can go to our website. We also have a journal on othering and belonging. And I should say at the Haas Institute, we organize around seven clusters. Uh, race is one of them. LGBTQ is one of them. Gender is one of them. Age is one of them. Religion is one of them. Uh, disability is one of them. And when I, I'm the founding director, and what I sort of thought about is that what do all these things have in common? And they're all sort of struggling around issues of othering and belonging. And there are different ways we can say to people, you belong or you don't belong. We can say it expressly. We can say it implicitly. We can organize space to say to people, you don't belong. So if you, have a, uh, if you don't have a ramp here and someone comes in a wheelchair, without saying a word, through the structure, you're saying you don't belong. Now, if you actually pick the person up and bring them in, the sense of not belonging doesn't go away. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of ways. So it's not just an idea. It's not just a psychological phenomenon. It's a structural, cultural, sociological phenomenon as well. And these are some of the things that are related to uh, othering and uh, ranging from uh, fear, categorization, um, uh, implicit bias, all those things are related to othering. Now, I'll say something <clears throat> that's maybe a little bit counterintuitive or even controversial. Sometimes when we hear about categories, especially as it deals with race, and you heard a little bit of this yesterday, can't we just drop the categories? Can't we just see each other as individuals? The answer is no. So let me just get that out of the way. It's, it, <laughs> It's a, it's a seductive question, but scientifically, we know the answer is no. And one of the reasons it's no is because of the way the mind is structured, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Also, you've heard a lot, you know, uh, uh, this conference is, uh, has a strong economic anchor. Every discipline has their own language bias, their own internal fights. Uh, and what we're trying to do is actually broaden that to have uh, disciplines and people who are not academics sort of talk to each other. And we have a different set of fights. 
Uh, but one of the fights we need to have is about how we think about the self. Now, uh, I've written about this in a book called Racing to Justice, but the self is organized around multiple axes. For an economist, they think of the self as being organized around the economic axis. So we make economic decisions. We make decisions about stuff. That's what motivates us. That's what incentivizes us. Uh, so most economic theories are about stuff, uh, although they try to broaden it a little bit and they talk about social capital. Uh, but it's actually still a movement from the grounding of stuff. Uh, but another way people think about themselves and organize themselves, both consciously and unconsciously, is around institutions, and political institutions, and efficacy. So the ability to affect the world. Uh, and that turns out to be very important. So political science, uh, scientists focus more and more on organizing around uh, politics and political structures and institutions. But there's a third area, which is um, ontological or spiritual. That, especially for most thinkers on the left, we actually are not that well schooled in. The right is much better at it. If you heard Reverend Barber, he talked about that some last night. And I would posit that all of these are important, and there may be more. They're interrelated, but they're not the same. And that part of the thing that happens, and this happening right now in the United States, Britain, um, or most of Europe, is that people are oftentimes making ontological, spiritual um, decisions, and we are responding to them, responding to them with economic uh, reactions. And at the extreme, those people seem irrational. So we keep saying, people keep voting against their interests. What we really mean is they're voting against their economic interests. But all people have more than economic interests. So my father's a Christian minister. Is it irrational for him to make a decision based upon his faith? To many economists, the answer would be yes. And they try to twist his faith to make it into some economic thing. Well, this is really about economics. He don't know it, but you know, that's really what he's doing. Uh, it's not what he's doing. Um, and so when Frank wrote the book, What's the Matter with Kansas, I wrote a blog saying nothing. Uh, what Frank was missing is that people in Kansas was making ontological decisions, being motivated by, by ontological concerns, and he kept making, uh, imposing an economic model onto an ontological concern. Uh, and so I think, and I wrote a blog um, in the Huffington Post, and I talked about something Donald Trump does well. And many of my friends, this was a month or two ago, and many of my friends were very upset. And they said, what do you mean something he does well? And I said, what he does well is he links economic concerns with ontological racial concerns. And the left does not do that. They try to reduce racial concerns to economic and class concerns. And not just economists do that, but I think many people in the social justice movement, they actually refuse to see the relationship between racial and social justice with the economic. And so part of what we're trying to do at this conference is sort of create some dialogue between these and see how these things push and pull each other. Uh, they're multi-directional, they're not one-directional. This is uh, building on a lot of people's work. So this is an interdisciplinary slide. And uh, one of the people, principals involved in this work is uh, Robert Putnam. You may remember that in the early 90s, he went to Europe. And what he said in the early 90s, uh, he said that there's a change in the demographics in Europe. There's a lot of people who are coming to Europe who are not part of the salient uh, group. And if this continues, it's going to create anxiety. And depending on how that anxiety is addressed, it's going to be a challenge to social welfare and the state. Now, now interesting, he was not saying there's going to be an economic crisis in Europe that's going to challenge the state. He was saying the demographic change is going to produce anxiety, and depending on how that anxiety is addressed, it could challenge the state. Now, when he wrote that in the 90s, first of all, he saw evidence of that already. We can measure anxiety. And he saw anxiety going up very fast in Europe. Um, there, and I was just in France, and they're talking about legacy French people now, so people who are who have been, been there a long time in the New French. Uh, and oftentimes the New French is a different religion, sometimes it's color-coded, but the point is, it's different, and it creates an anxiety. 
When we have this anxiety, and we all have anxiety, life is about anxiety, um, when we deal with things that are new, when we deal with change very rapidly, it creates anxiety, it creates stress. Sometimes that anxiety can be thought of in terms of just energy, and it's not positive or negative. So the example I use is you're taking your five-year-old to school for the first time. Uh, and you say, and, the, and these kids get very anxious, right? This is a change. Uh, so you're going to go to a new place tomorrow. You're going to go meet some. How the kid deals with that anxiety depends on the parent, the narrative that they're given. So here's two narratives. One of them is, you're going to go to school tomorrow, and you're going to meet a bunch of new friends. Uh, you're going to learn new stuff. Uh, you're going to have play dates. It's like, ooh, 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 I, can, I can't wait to go. You know, I'm still anxious, but now there's something good that's going to happen with this. The other story might be, OK, now you're going to school tomorrow. There are a lot of different people there. Some of them are bullies. They, those bullies want to take your stuff. It's like, uh, I don't want to go to school. Can I, can I just stay home? Be careful there. Be careful. So those are the two dominant ways. And anxiety gets mediated through leadership. We have anxiety, but the form it takes depends on leadership, narrative, structures, and cultures. So what Donald Trump has represented is not simply reflecting anxiety that's in society. He's helped shape it. He's given, uh, given it uh, not just even permission. He's actually helping to shape it. Uh, and a lot of this is done unconsciously. So you have these two ways of thinking about it. One of them is breaking. That is, things are changing. Here comes the other. Here comes people who are different than you. You should be afraid. And Trump told us that, right? They're coming to rape your women. They're coming to steal your stuff. They're coming to do all this bad stuff. You should be afraid. You should be pissed. You should be angry. And the people respond with being angry, being, being afraid. Uh, those are called breaking stories or breaking narratives. The other narrative is a bridging narrative. It's like, oh, great diversity. And you get to have you know, new food, new friends, learn about different cultures. And you make something positive. Uh, those are called bridging stories. And they're quite powerful, bridging or breaking stories. The way you actually tell bridging stories is to actually link someone up through our collective suffering. Uh, uh, so you think about Warmth of the Suns by Isabel Wilkins. She tells about the great migration from the south to the north. But she tells it in a way that almost anyone who's migrated, whether you migrated from Europe or Africa or South America, you can see yourself in that book. She tells about human suffering in a way that you can identify. So one way you bridge is that you actually let, you bring people's suffering into the conversation, and then you talk about a vision that you share without becoming each other. I would posit that over 90% of the stories that we tell in the United States are breaking stories. We do it on the right, and we do it on the left. Now, we do it more profoundly on the right. We're almost explicit on the right in terms of being afraid of the other. But we do it on the, on the left as well. And we're very bad and very suspicious of bridging stories. So part of this is about the mind science. So we're talking about a couple of different factors in the mind science, particularly uh, implicit bias, anxiety, and stereotype threat. Um, part of it is just understanding how the brain works. We have an old brain and a new brain. And the old brain is big and fast, and it does a lot of stuff. It's kind of crude. The new brain is very, very slow. It's eloquent, but it can't keep up. And it does very little at a time. By some accounts, we process 40 bits of information, four zero bits of information a second, consciously. That's the new brain. During that same second, we process 11 million bits of information unconsciously. So 40 versus 11 million. Uh, at the extreme, some social psychologists and neuropsychologists says the consciousness is a fraud. It's not doing hardly anything. That all the stuff is done at the unconscious level and it's given to the conscious and the conscious thinks, I've made a decision. Uh, and, uh, and so part of what we're suggesting is to better 
get a sense of the unconscious, and the better learn to communicate and engage with the unconscious. They have different rules between the conscious and the unconscious. And part of the process of othering happens both at the conscious and unconscious level. Now, one of the things about the conscious and unconscious, because they're different processes, although they're related, is they can point in different directions. So you may have one feeling at a conscious level, one thought at the conscious level, and a very different feeling and thought and process at an unconscious level. When there's a conflict, in most instances, the unconscious wins out. Uh, so it's very important to understand what's going on at the unconscious level. The unconscious does many things. It sorts, it creates categories, and it creates associations, and it fills in gaps. Uh, one of the reasons we can't just see individuals is that we literally are processing too much information. And so we, the, the brain has developed shortcuts to lump this information together. And it's called schemas. We can also call it categories. We simply could not process information uh, at an individual level and survive. So categories are not going to go away. What those categories are, what meaning we associate with them, we can move that some, but we can't get to the place where we just directly experience the world. And the categories come with certain social meanings. Um, I'm going to have you do a, couple, a little exercise in a minute, but let me just pause for one second and make something very clear. When people hear about social psychology or neuroscience or implicit bias, they think about something going on between their ears. Uh, the unconscious is radically social. It's actually interacting with the environment and the structure. Uh, and so one way of thinking about it is Pavlov's dog. You ring a bell, you feed the dog. You ring a bell, you feed the dog. You ring a bell, the dog starts salivating. Uh, the dog didn't just think of that. The dog, the, the unconscious is habituated. It's habituated by things happening frequently and in close proximity, it draws a relationship. The frequency and close proximity are things happening in the world outside of the brain. But the brain then interprets it that these things are associated because they're happening fast, they're happening close together, and they're happening frequently. So in a sense, and I don't mean to call anybody a dog, but in a sense, we're all like Pavlov's dog. Uh, and we don't have to think about it. Uh, it, we just, it just happens, and it's called automaticity or deeply habituated. The brain is deeply habituated, and most of the time that works well for us, but sometimes it does not work well for us. So we're going to play a little game. I'm going to show you some colors, and I want you to say uh, as, as quickly and as loudly as you can what the color is. Now, there's be some letters as well, but I don't want you to think about the letters. I want you just to focus on the color. Is that clear? All right. So are you ready? Ready. Does anybody have any coffee uh, or speed or coca something? All right, a little more energy. All right, let's, 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 do, let's do it again. Ready? Wait, 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 what happened? You were, you were going, doing so well. <laughs> you were, what happened? We just got trumped. You just got trumped. So, <laughs> so I asked you not to pay attention to the words, the letters. Were any of you paying attention to the letters? Okay, so, okay why, why did, I told you not to. I thought we had an agreement. What happened? You don't follow orders. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone who tried to follow the orders? Why, why, why can you do it? But, but we're not looking at the words. <laughs> okay. That's right. The point is you can't, but you can't turn off the unconscious. Uh, it's on, and it does not control by the conscious. You can influence it. They say it's like, it's like an, uh, uh, um, uh, a gnat riding an elephant. The elephant is the unconscious. The conscious is the gnat. And the, gnat is, the elephant's going to largely do what it wants to do. Uh, and so when you, when you try to turn off the unconscious, it just keeps going, doing what it's doing. And so what, is, what builds up 
the schemas in the unconscious is coming from society. Society tells the unconscious what's important. And in our society, one of the things that's important is race, gender. Uh, and so learning to, we, as good liberals, and some of us may even think of ourselves as progressive, we know race should not matter. So the conscious says, I'm not going to see race. I'm not going to notice race because only bad people and maybe some of those Trump supporters notice race. I don't notice race. The, the unconscious says, you can do what you want to do. I'm noticing. And it does it fast. And it has meetings about it. And it then it creates reactions. And we can measure this. Uh, we can measure it through skin resistance. We can measure it through stress. We can measure it through any number of things. So when we actually are trying to be colorblind, the unconscious is radically politically incorrect. I say, oh yeah, here, com here comes. And so when we actually have tension between the conscious and unconscious, we have what they call cognitive depletion. It actually makes us tired. And it actually creates, it slows us down in terms of interacting with the world. So you can imagine someone going home from a hard day's work and the husband says to the wife, so how was your day? He said, oh, it was all right. Kind of stressful though because I was trying not to see race all day. Uh, and it, it literally, it stresses us out. So just a couple other little games to get, just to get a sense of this. Do you see, uh, can you see the letters up there, the A and B? So look at the top. Uh, can you see it now? Yeah. All right, you see A, you see B? Okay, good. So which letter or which square is darker? The A square or the B square? How many think A is darker? All right. How many think B is darker? How many people don't care? <laughs> All right. So it won't surprise you. The A and B are exactly the same color, exactly the same shade. How is that possible? Why do you see A being so much darker than B? What's going on? Oh, you have a pattern, and you have a pattern of light and dark. Uh, there's a cylinder cast, casting a shadow, and the unconscious mind is making adjustments for how light something should be if there's a shadow. So all that's happening without any effort on your part. In fact, even though you know they're the same shade, it's still hard to see that they're not. That's how we engage with the world. We don't uh, see the world as it is. We see the world as we expect to see it. So they're exactly the same. Okay, so how many, what do you see here? Anyone? All right, triangle, right? And a few people see Pac-Man. Uh, there's, there's always a couple in the audience. Uh, it will not surprise you at this point, this late date, that there is no triangle there. So if there's no triangle there, why do you see a triangle? You're filling in the blank. You see what you expect to see. So you're prepared to see a triangle suggested by some other configurations, and the unconscious does the rest. It fills in the gaps. And there are gaps everywhere. And it does it very fast. And it's normally a good thing. It's normally helping us to survive. So the, the white in this is exactly the same. There's no differentiation between the white that you think is a triangle and the white that's the background. It's all background. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple of more. I want you to pay attention to the screen and tell me what you see. Ready? Say what? Okay. One more time. What did you see that time? What? Okay, so you saw a white man. Let me go back and do this for you one more time. Now, the first time that I did that, most of you just saw a flash. You didn't see a face, right? So this is an experiment that uh, a friend and colleague, Jennifer Eberhardt, who was a professor at Stanford, did. Um, what she did was she subliminally, you can speed up how quickly we see something. And when, you, when it goes at a subliminal level, it means we don't consciously see it. And what she showed is that when we don't consciously see a face, 
We can show a face to the unconscious. Remember, unconscious is very fast. Conscious is very slow. So the unconscious is seeing it. The conscious is not seeing it. She then shows them a degraded figure and asks people to tell them, tell her, when they can identify what the figure is. And this is the figure. And what, she see, what the experiment shows is that when people subliminally see a black face, they're able to identify guns at a faster rate. Now, where does that come from? It comes from the uh, stimulus in our society that says black men and violence and black men and guns are associated with each other. Now, some of you as our economists and, and sociologists will say, you'll notice that, no, no, no. White men per capita own more guns than black men per capita. The unconscious is not interested in statistics. It's not, in, it's not interested in footnotes. Uh, it's getting information from the frequency in which it sees stuff on television, which it hears stuff on the radio, from society. It's not going into the library. And so for, in our society, we have an association between black men and guns that's factually, that's counterfactual. When you show someone a black face, a black man, they're primed, this is what this is called, they're primed to see a gun. Now think about that. A police is in the streets, they see a black man. There's a gun. Must be a gun. Not because necessarily the police is a racist or the police wants to shoot somebody. It's that in our society, we are sending the message that black men are dangerous and black men have guns. Now, it's interesting. This impact not only affects white police, but also affects black police. We're talking about what's in society. So if the air is dirty, everybody in society is breathing that air. Uh, now, it's not the same. That is, these, we're talking about uh, biases and stereotypes and how they get formed. They don't get formed equally because we have experiences that might counteract some of those biases. So in my example, I have a father who's 96 years old, lives here in Detroit. He's one of the nicest, uh, most gentle people you ever meet. So I have a daily experience of a black man without a gun. But most white people don't have a daily experience with a black man at all. And so they're just taking, unmitigated, all the stuff from society. Um, can you show this video? This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? And, and this is actually not a good, I mean, because it's, it's bled out a little bit. But the point is, is that most people will not see the bear because you've been primed. You have our conscious attention is selective. We can only, the conscious can only process a little bit of information at a time. So what information do we process? We're told which information is important, and that's what we notice consciously. We also notice a lot of things unconsciously, and we can show that unconsciously you all saw the bear. But consciously, most of you did not see the bear because you were primed. Your consciousness was, ex was exhausted by two things, your counting and the team in white. Your 40 bits are gone. Now, the point is, is that we're primed all the time. We're primed to say, notice black kids acting out in school. So when a black kid acts out and a white kid acts out, a teacher is more likely to notice the black kid acting out. Not because the teacher is racist, not because the teacher hates black kids, but they've been primed to notice certain things. Now, if you were to go to a teacher and say, why are you punishing the black kid and not the white kid? The teacher will give you incense. It's like, what are you saying about me? I love all kids. Um, I'll tell you a very quick story. Um, 
I got assaulted outside of my house. I lived in a fancy neighborhood in Bexley, uh, in Ohio, outside, part of Columbus. And uh, it was late at night. Three white guys jumped me. They had masks on. They, they fired a gun. Uh, my neighbor, who was, uh, is an appellate federal judge, uh, and the other neighbors heard the gun. They looked out, turned on their lights, looked out the window, and they called the police. Um, a day or so later, I'm talking to my neighbor. We're friends. His kids come over to my house. My kids go over to his house. And he said, did you see all that commotion the other day? And I said, what commotion? He said, there was this big black guy. I mean, this guy was big, uh, like afro like this. And uh, he was beating up on some white guys. And I said, well, that was me. He said, no, no, that wasn't you. I know you. This guy was big. Um, <laughs> and I said, no, that was me. And then there was this awkward silence. Uh, now, after I got attacked by these guys, I went to the doctor the next day. And again, the doctor was someone I had, was, had a good relationship with. And he said, well, what happened? I told him. It was on television and stuff. And he said, well, how do you feel? I said, I'm in a lot of pain. He said, oh, well, t you know. Take some aspirins and take the rest of the day off. But I want to take some x-rays just, just to be sure. So again, I, I went home. I get a call about four hours later, and the doctor's screaming at me. The doctor's white. And he says, why didn't you tell me you were in pain? I said, I did tell you I was in pain. He said, no, no. I mean, you really, I said, I see you have four broken ribs. Uh, and he was yelling at me, and I think, again, he's a little embarrassed. How is it that he misread, that he, he assumed I was OK? In our society, we don't assume black people have the same level of pain as white people. And it affects the medical profession. Uh, so the point is, is that we have all these things that are creating these biases. And most of them are social. So we're not talking about individual biases. And I don't even like the word bias, because we're biased against the word bias. Uh, and most of us think that, well, if I try really hard, I'm going to really concentrate because uh, I don't want to be biased. It doesn't work that way. The way the mind works is that it creates these associations, and some of them are misfiring, and they create biases. And they do it based on what's salient in our society. Um, and uh, so we have the many different kinds of bias, confirmation bias. Um, I have about, I think, four more slides. We are programmed to recognize our fellow species. So when we see someone, we're programmed to recognize them. This is work by Susan Fiss. What she did is she looked, she divided, uh, created a, a quadrant. And on one axis was how much you like someone. The second axis was how smart uh, you think they are. And she found that when you like someone and you think they're smart, we're, they're admired. Uh, we think great things about them. We're primed to think that they're competent. Uh, if you don't like someone, but you think they're smart, you respect them, but you don't really like them. Uh, and in that first category are white men in our society. These are social things measured in society. In the second one are Asians. We think they're very smart, but as society, we don't particularly like them. There's a third quadrant, which is we like someone, but we don't think they're very smart. In that category, we put women. We like them. Yeah, yeah, I like that, you know. Just don't want to be president. Not that smart. And then the fourth category is where we dislike someone and we think they're not very smart. That's where blacks, undocumented immigrants, ex-offenders, homeless people go. Now, when we don't like someone, and we think they're not very smart in the extreme, we actually do not see them as human. So there's a part of the brain that lights up when we see another human. Uh, and when, when people are disliked and we don't think they're very smart, that part of the brain does not light up. In fact, something else happens. We actually see them, and we, the part of the brain associated with disgust lights up. And I've written about this basically saying we can't develop effective policy for people that we don't see as human. Uh, people that are other to such an extreme that we're disgusted by them. 
And I think a lot of what you're seeing happening in the country is that as the country becomes more diverse with these people who somehow we don't necessarily like as a nation and we don't think they're very smart. So you heard uh, Derek talk about how we look at black people. They're lazy, you know, they talk too loud, you know, uh, and you can have individual exceptions. It doesn't disrupt your group representation. So part of this is us associated with what's called stereotypes. Again, we all have stereotypes. We can't entirely get rid of them. We can become aware of them. Uh, stereotypes work in both directions. So if I'm aware that I'm being stereotyped, it affects me. If you are stereotyping me, it affects you. Uh, and this is the work, again, Derek made mention of it, Claude Steele. He shows that when a group is deeply stereotyped on something, it actually negatively affects their behavior, and it causes a stereotype threat. Uh, and just to give you one example, he has a group of women come in at Stanford, and he gives them, uh, he, he gives them this line. He says, I love teaching here at Stanford because there's so many bright women. And then 20 minutes later, he gives them a math test, and they bomb the test. They don't do well. Second group, same from the same pool, with the same ability, he says, uh, you know, I love teaching here at Stanford because there's so many Asian American women. He gives them the same test, now they ace it. How do you explain that? So in the first example, he's, through his words, he's activated their, their female identity. They are aware that women are not supposed to be good at math. So now they're operating under stereotype threat. In the second example, he activates their Asian American identity. They are where the Asian Americans are supposed to be good at math. And they now perform well at math. We've actually been able to reduce the performance of uh, the gap between black and white high school students by more than 50% using this technique. And it can last for as long as three years. Uh, but mu much of the things we do, instead of reducing the threat, actually exacerbates the threat. Uh, and so we need to be aware of what we're doing to actually deal with these threats. And these are some of the effects of being subject to a stereotype threat. One of the things that happen is when you're threatened, your mind is split. On one hand, you're dealing with the task at hand. On the other one, you're worried about the threat. How am I being perceived? Do people like me? Do I really belong here? Um, and there's a lot of data on this. I don't have time to go over it all now. Uh, but it's, the impact is huge. So the point is that we have these biases. And these biases affect our behavior. Uh, they leak into our everyday experience. Uh, and they are, as I said, collective. Um, we cannot completely avoid them. But we can do things to actually notice them. And we can do things to uh, manage them. So the last area I want to talk about is anxiety. And uh, Alexis knows I've been trying to talk about this for about five years. I've been saying, based on Putnam's work and other work, the anxiety in the country is going up. And I didn't, I didn't include one slide. But we measure people's anxiety as the country change at the conscious level and unconscious level. So we talk about, pretty soon, there's not going to be a majority. For, most, for many Americans, black, white, Latinos, and otherwise, that concept, the idea that we're going to be a majority minority country, is at a conscious level, it's OK. And we may even celebrate it. Diversity is a great thing. Yay. The unconscious is going crazy. It's like, oh my god, what can we do? Can we build a wall? Can we stop this? Uh, and, uh, and again, along comes someone who actually speaks to the unconscious, names the anxiety, and helps them negotiate it. What we oftentimes do on the left is that people get in touch with anxiety, or we become aware of it, we attack them for it. If you're uncomfortable because there are a lot of Muslims in your neighborhood, you must be xenophobic. As opposed to, yeah, uh, people have a hard time dealing with change. And the anxiety is a normal social behavior. You probably have heard the adage that if you get married, or you change your marital status, getting married, change your job, get a better job, and move, and within two years, your risk of a heart attack goes up by 50%. Now, all of those are good things, but they're change. 
and the body has a hard time processing change. And so when it comes too much too fast, it puts us under a lot of stress. Um, so what can we do to, to uh, change some of this? One of us be aware of our environment, the messages our environment is, hap is, is, uh, is in. The other one I always suggest in terms of breaking and bridging. And the third is critical mass. When a group that's being stigmatized is in an environment where they're an extreme minority, the stress levels go up uh, at an unconscious level. They don't perform as well. They're aware that other people are aware that they're there, uh, even though people may not say anything. Uh, and so when you get a critical mass, it starts to change the dynamics in the environment, both for um, uh, the dominant group and for the receiving group. Uh, I think one of our great challenges moving forward in the United States and Europe is what do we do with our growing multiple diversity? How do we understand it? How do we structure it? And how do we make it something positive and not make it subject to people who will use it as a demagogue? Thank you.